So one of my favorite things on Twitter is when you kind of miss the original source material of a meme and you're just seeing everybody's takes on it. Like about a week ago, I looked onto Twitter and I saw a million tweets about Nicki Minaj's cousin's friend's testicles, um, commonly referred to as Ballgate, which I consider to be an incredible learning opportunity. In response to the original tweet, the Nicki Minaj stands or barbs have been extra parasocial and I think we can learn a little from that as mindless stands ourselves. So I'm going to break down the term parasocial for anyone who is not as terminally online as I am or a Sarah Z subscriber and then I'll give you a brief villain origin story which is all just a little foreplay for the main course. Nicki Minaj's drama as a case study to analyze the pros and cons of parasocial interaction and by the end of this video we'll answer the question are parasocial relationships bad? So, if you're not as terminally online as I am, I'll break down the drama for you. A few weeks ago, on Twitter, there was the big Nikki vs Taco vs Hassan ultimate showdown. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Basically, in the lead up to the Met Gala, Nikki tweets. My cousin in Trinidad won't get the vaccine, because his friend got it and became impotent. His testicles became swollen. His friend was weeks away from getting married. Now the girl called off the wedding. So just pray on it and make sure you're comfortable with your decision, not bullied. For context, she has 28 million followers and her cousin's friend has an STI, allegedly. So a bunch of content creators respond to this, including his son Packer, who's relevant in a second, we'll get to that. He tweets, the world awaits your wonderful contribution to the scientific community. Pretty innocuous. But then the next day, Tucker Carlson gets on national television and makes a plea for Nicki Minaj's cousin's friend and his swollen engorged enlarged testicles to contact Fox News. Nikki shares this to her once again 28 million Twitter followers with a bullseye emoji. Someone links this to Hassan, he's live on stream when he begins to write a reply, which reads, I'm telling you, Tucker Carlson wouldn't even let you on the bus let alone the back of it but here you are reducing it to simple no real so obvious yikes and just to put all my cards on the table i am a hasanabi head and so i was in the chat at the time yelling at him everyone was yelling at him so he buckles he caves and instead he writes Tucker Carlson is not only vaccinated, but doesn't like black and brown immigrants coming into the country. This isn't about parties, there are plenty of racist Democrats too. Significantly less abrasive. The Bobs, however, are unable to defend Queen Nikki's platforming of renowned white supremacist Tucker Carlson, so they latch onto Hassan's drafted reply. The hours that follow are a testament to how chronically online Hassan is as he stubbornly defends himself against the parasocial hordes. A double down for 400. Hassan's subset of Twitter have decided this is indefensible for the most part, rightfully so, and wait for him to apologize, which to be fair, he does the next day after reading a fan's heartfelt post in the subreddit. On stream though, he calls out his Twitter followers a few times for not defending him while simultaneously criticizing the hive mind Bob's defense of Queen Nikki. Double, double down, down for a thousand. thousand. I'm white, so it's not really my place to say whether this is offensive or not, but I can at least say it's pretty bad for optics to joke about black segregation as a white man. But I'll leave a few black creators' comments on this in the description. I'm gonna go ahead and make some generalizations here. I think the Bobs are typically very accepting of left wing, or at the very least, liberal politics. I think typically they would hate someone like Tucker Carlson and anyone who supports him. So their defense of Nikki here is quite contradictory. Their main defense is that Nikki never told anyone not to get the vaccine, which is true. She only said to do your own research and not be bullied into a decision. But when they're faced with valid criticisms like Tucker Carlson's very racist history, they lash out. Hassan and his stands have taken quite the hit on Twitter. The number one criticism of them is their parasocial attachment, ironically, and that they would defend Hassan against anything. And I think they're kind of right. So a few months ago, I came across a YouTube video from a channel called Daily Dose of Hassan Abi. In the video, Twitch streamer Hassan Piker was reacting to an iDubbbz video, and me, being a horny little groomer, was instantly hooked. Hot man talks about leftist politics, 
practically handcrafted for my enjoyment. This is my first introduction to Twitch, which for the uninitiated is a live streaming platform, and it was basically opiates for my neurodivergent brain. Just to give a little information on my credentials, every day I watch a bare minimum of three hours worth of Hassan content. I see him on Twitter, I see him on TikTok, on Instagram, on Twitch, I have friends that watch him, I watch other streamers who watch him, so much of my life is consumed by this man, it is embarrassing. I can admit this is a parasocial relationship and I should definitely cut back, but I don't want to, so in an effort to justify my own problem, a few weeks ago I began researching. Just in case there's anyone watching this who finds himself in a similar predicament, there's absolutely no judgement here, besties. No stones being thrown in this glass house. So the term parasocial seems to have only recently come into vogue, and we tend to hear about it a lot in the context of internet personalities. But actually, this term predates that type of celebrity by decades. It was coined by Donald Horston and Richard Wall in 1956, and initially used to describe the relationship between radio personalities and radio listeners. One of the striking characteristics of the new mass media, radio, television, and the movies, is that they give the illusion of face-to-face -face relationship with the performer. The most remote and illustrious men are met as if they were in the circle of one's peers. We propose to call this seeming face-to-face -face relationship between the spectator and performer a parasocial relationship. Yeah, they're also talking about movie characters and television characters, but in the context of streamers, radio presenters are the most relevant, so we're just going to focus on that. Horston and Wall noticed that when the radio presenter engages with the audience, for example, directly addresses them, the audience feels a part of the performance. The audience is transformed from passive observer into active participant in the show. The article calls this imitation of conversation a parasocial interaction. They describe this as a facsimile of friendship, acknowledging the good and bad in such attachments. For example, they notice that the radio announcer benefits from the relationship by being rewarded with a loyal audience who aim to reciprocate the relationship through whatever means available, be that monetary or laborial. In the context of streamers, we see this as subscriptions, donations, or viewers acting at the behest of their streamer. Think when Hassan asks chat to find him a link and hundreds of people are rushing to be the first to send it in. This is driven by an urge to reciprocate what we subconsciously perceive as a friendship, one that we are so rarely given the opportunity to reciprocate. Recently, scholars have adapted the idea for more modern media, like Rubin and McHugh in 2009, who propose a model to describe the development of relationships. They use this model to reflect typical interpersonal relationship development. Think making a friend. You talk with them more. You like them more. You get closer. Your perceived relationship importance increases. Rubin and McHugh transpose this model for parasocial relationships in the context of television personalities, and posit that increased exposure leads to increased interaction, leads eventually to increased relationship importance. There is a direct correlation between perceived relationship importance and exposure. The increased exposure provided by Twitch and other streaming platforms further facilitates these relationships and pales in comparison to something like YouTube. Other content creators, and I'm just going to stick with Twitch streamers here, have talked about this. Notably Ludwig Argren, who posted a video to his YouTube channel titled I Am Not Your Friend, in which he discusses the detrimental effect of these relationships. Just so we're clear, I do like this video. I think it's good that he's very publicly denouncing these kinds of attachments, and he talks about it a lot on stream. But he does often compare streamers to other kinds of content creators, like YouTubers. He often talks about having grown up with YouTubers and being attached to them, but not parasocially. I do think it's important to discuss the differences between YouTube and Twitch, and why Twitch seems to breed this kind of relationship so much more. So, first of all, this is not your mom's internet anymore. Things like YouTube are a lot more like television, in that there's no real-time interaction with the viewer, and they're typically a lot more polished than streams. Also, YouTubers tend to produce a lot less content. For example, Hassan streams about 8 hours every day, having famously streamed for almost half of 2020. Compare this to a YouTuber, who uploads at most a video a day, typically less than an hour long. And I'm talking about the real Sigma grind set guys here, guys like PewDiePie with huge production crews and it's, it's just a fraction of the content. If we follow the model proposed by Ruben and McHugh, there's a direct correlation between amount of content consumed and perceived relationship importance. And this is all before we even talk about the chat. When I was a kid, I was obsessed with Dodie, a YouTuber turned singer-songwriter, but the difference here is that I was painfully aware that she did not know I existed. The closest thing I had to real-time interaction was commenting as quickly as I could on her YouTube uploads, and I was a kid, so I didn't have the financial freedom to support her financially in any capacity, really. But if I had, you best believe I would have been buying all that much. Dodie posted a lot in her YouTube peak. She had two channels, and she used to do the, like, video every day thing uh, that I'm sure you remember. Things like video every day in August or vlogmas. But she never came close 
but she never came close to the amount of content the typical Twitch streamer creates, and she rarely interacted in the comment section. Compare this to the real-time interaction afforded by Twitch chat. If we look once again at Hassan and watch just how quickly his chat moves, all the people in there clamoring for his attention, we see that this parasocial interaction is amplified by a billion. Streamers engage with chat a lot. In fact, a lot of Hassan's content is just reading and replying to chat or stealing their jokes and farming the kick Ws. If you're not familiar with Twitch, I don't know why you've watched so much of this video, but whatever. Streamers let you donate to them. Not subscribing and receiving benefits, just straight up giving money to a person you like. On some streams, you might get a little text-to-speech message where you can talk directly to your streamer. On Hassan's stream, there's like this fun little graphic of his dog that displays your Twitch username and sometimes he acknowledges them, usually he doesn't. Streamers, as much as they denounce these relationships, benefit directly from them. If chat wasn't so obsessed with getting a crumb of attention from their streamer, they wouldn't throw so much money at them. As chatters, we're gifted this feeling of friendship and companionship that we're so rarely given the opportunity to reciprocate. That's why we're driven by this innate urge to financially or laboriously support the streamer. Okay, so let's get into the nitty gritty here. Why are we so invested in these people who we know are un unable to ever feel the same way about us? Here is where I blame everything on capitalism. One of the benefits of these kinds of relationships is that they aren't reciprocated. As a chatter, you can sit with Hassan for eight hours a day, sit in the offline chat or the Discord for even longer, completely obligation free. If we look at the model of friendship again, you might realize that for a typical interpersonal relationship, this kind of thing is two-sided. You're perceiving a relationship as more and more significant, but they're perceiving that of you as well. This doesn't happen on Twitch. You can watch for months, every day, and Hassan isn't going to notice if you suddenly just stop watching. There are tens of thousands of people in there clamoring for his attention, He's physically incapable of taking note of all of us, which is both comforting and depressing. Obligation-free relationships are increasingly more sustainable because capitalism has made maintaining a regular relationship so difficult. So I'm gonna introduce you to a big word, atomization. It means that we are gradually becoming more and more individual. Since the industrial revolution, people have withdrawn more and more from community. We call this the gradual atomization of society. Work days are getting longer. The work-life balance is gradually eroding. See exhibit A. Jeff Bezos calls work-life balance a debilitating phrase. Here's what the Amazon CEO and world's richest person swears by instead. Spoiler alert, it's just... It's just working longer. It's working more. That's what he advocates for. That's what he believes in instead. So, hypothetically, for the sake of debate, Let's say, you've just finished an eight hour shift. You've had minimal time to socialize all day, lest our supreme leader, Jeff Bezos, add to your time off task. But you're lonely. We all crave human connection, and not the kind you get from brief meetings in the tea room between long, monotonous hours in the cubicle. The, this need for companionship has led very many people to friendship light. You receive some sense of belonging and fulfill a little of your need for companionship without having to further exhaust your social battery. Also, it's worth mentioning that there are lots of people who actually make genuine connections within the communities fostered by these content creators. There are lots of people who make friends in Discord servers or on Stan Twitter. So, you know, this is all seeming like a net positive, right? But I am going to bring in the bad news now. So, we know that these parasocial interactions allow people to ease the sense of loneliness that is ever more pervasive in our capitalist society but it's super important to acknowledge that this is not a real friendship. You can't call Hassan in the middle of a crisis like you can a friend. Maybe for however many hours you're watching his streams, you feel something akin to friendship, but we all know on some level that it's not. In psychology, these are called A-leafs as opposed to B-leaf. An A-leaf is defined as an automatic or habitual belief-like attitude, particularly one that is in tension with a person's explicit beliefs. We know consciously that our streamer doesn't know we exist. We believe that but there's a subconscious A-leaf that he does know we exist and that he cares for us in turn. This A-leaf convinces us that our streamer, who we watch so many hours of, is a part of our inner circle, which gets tricky when we get into matters of representation. I'm not going to delve into all of that, but just know that your subconscious mind views the people you watch as part of your inner circle. So if you're, say, a young boy watching a lot of alt-right content creators, you're going to pick up a lot of that rhetoric and lingo. Like how I say words like based and red build because I watch losers. So it's very easy to assume that you know better. People tend to say, oh, well, I know that's unhealthy, so it's not going to happen to me. Again, A-leafs are not rational, and they're often in conflict with our rational beliefs. Your poor little affection-starved brain craves companionship, and there's no amount of daily affirmations that are going to keep you safe from that kind of attachment. 
I am not unhealthily attached to my streamer. I am not unhealthily attached to my streamer. I am not unhealthily attached to my streamer. We have a rational disconnect when it comes to these kinds of things. Hassan does not know me and is incapable of feeling any level of affection toward me as an individual. I know this, I believe this, but that doesn't stop the subconscious A-leaf that he is in fact my best friend. He reads my chat sometimes, so. So this is getting very doom and gloom, um, and I am just going to make that worse actually. As a viewer, you feel like you know everything about your streamer and you come to expect things of them, like you would a friend. Sarah Z has a really good video on this, if you want to watch that. Shouting out smaller content creators, you know. Gotta support the little guys. <laughs> In the case of Hassan, this is a little more logical because he's very outspoken about his leftist politics, as opposed to some someone like Linky Charge. So, in the immediate aftermath of the gold tweet, we see swarms of stands on both sides defending their problematic fave. But here's the main difference. Nikki stands don't have to justify her actions. I, I mean this in the sense that she's a musician first. But the main difference is Nikki stands don't have to try and justify her actions. I, as in, she's a musician first. They follow her on Twitter or Instagram or they run stand accounts because they like her music. Compare this with Hassan a political commentator who often speaks out against racist and white nationalist rhetoric. It's a lot more jarring to see him make light of black trauma when he prides himself on having a safe and tolerant community. There were plenty of Nikki stands that denounced her tweet and anti-vaccine sympathies, but there was also a very large faction of conservative bobs, which kind of seems like a contradiction, and bobs who were unable to see a flaw in their fave. This is what is interesting to me. Obviously for Hassan, some stands were very disappointed by the insensitive tweet, because we expect a certain standard of him. He's a political com he's a political commentator. He makes fun of racist hogs for a living and then mocks black oppression. But some fans were defending him to the death. The Hassanabi heads who are falling on their sword on Twitter are hard to read. I genuinely can't tell if they think he's in the right or if they're so parasocially attached they can't see this obvious misstep. See, when we view our streamers as our friends, we come to expect things of them the way you would a friend. This leads to irrationally defending them or feeling personally slighted by the smallest mistake. Okay, it's much easier to read the barbs here because if we assume, typically they wouldn't support Tucker Carlson, but they choose to here by proxy. The initial bold tweet could maybe be justified. She's just asking people to do their own research and not be bullied into a decision. The Tucker Carlson tweet, however, is not so ambiguous. So I'm not going to go into Tucker Carlson's whole history because this video is already stupidly long. But just know that he's a Fox News reporter and there are a million clips online of him calling immigrants dirty or just making generally racist, xenophobic, puritanical comments that negatively impact people like Nikki, a Trinidadian immigrant with hits like Anaconda. Despite this knowledge, the Bobs tried their hardest to hold the line. Essentially, they tried to say that he's simply a conservative and to disregard him as a political commentator is the same as voting purely on party lines. This, of course, is stupid and Nikki's quote tweet is indefensible. So why are the Barb's even bothering with trying to defend her? As previously mentioned, increased exposure directly correlates to increased relationship significance. But Nikki's not online nearly as much as Hassan. The reason for this is stan culture. Nikki has a very active Twitter subset, who spend their whole days in online experiences talking and posting about her and her music. They're exposed to her and her content through each other. This is what's really interesting to me, how we create these stan accounts for celebrities and we deify them in our rhetoric. Nikki stands are especially vicious, racking up numerous accounts of doxing and harassing anyone who has criticised her and her music. I can't say for sure why they're so defensive of her, but it's safe to say she has previously played into it. For the record, I love Nikki, please don't dox me, and I love her music, please don't dox me. <laughs> I think that some healthy awareness of our relationships helps prevent these things before they reach doxing heights. In our current modern day, I think parasocial relationships are basically inevitable. The prevalence of long-form content like two-hour video essays and Twitch streams and the increased exposure through other social media platforms makes it harder and harder to distinguish between our actual friends and celebrities. Okay, now I'm going to enter my making baseless claims era, which means in normal people speak that I'm going to give my opinions as a fellow parasocial freak with absolutely no qualifications. The concept of parasocial interaction isn't inherently negative. The companionship offered by content creators and their communities genuinely helps a lot of people, 
but it also has the potential to harm a lot of people. I think the healthiest way to navigate this new normal is to be aware of your unhealthy attachments. I don't think I'll ever be free of these parasocial shackles, but I can try my hardest to see through the stand mentality and critically consume the content I like. I love Hassan and I probably will for a while yet, but he does say dumb shit sometimes. I'm aware of that and I try my hardest to think critically about his takes even though my gut reaction is to immediately side with him. I encourage anyone watching to do the same and also maybe be aware that you should cut back on your viewership. I probably should, but I won't. Anyway, to answer the question posed at the beginning of the video, are parasocial relationships bad? Yes. <laughs> They are. I would say that there are few people in the world who are wholly unable to maintain real friendships and rely solely on streams for their only source of interpersonal connection. Although I know there are people out there like that, sadly, I think that most people do have friends online or in real life and despite that still become unhealthily attached to their icons. It's not great to be routinely sacrificing sleep to catch streams, but I do it. People have always and will always do things that are bad for them. There are people who smoke, there are kids who stay up late playing Nintendogs under the covers, and there will be people who watch ungodly amounts of Twitch streams. I don't think it's something to feel shameful about as long as you're able to critically consume the media. Anyway, thank you for watching this very long video. It's the first video essay I've ever made, uh, so please don't bully me. Um, I made a Patreon, there's not really any bonus content, there's a poll there right now for my next video, um, but maybe if you just want to throw money at me, go ahead, the link is in the description. And just to reiterate, I love Nicki Minaj and her music, and this one is for the boys with the boomin system, please don't dox me. Top down AC with the coolin system, please don't dox me. When you come up in the club, he be blazing up, please don't dox me. Stacks on deck and he's saving up, please don't dox me. He ill, he real, he not gonna dox me. He pop bottles and he pop, not gonna dox me. Cool, he's dope, please don't dox me.